Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Nice to have all of you with us via Zoom again. Um, over the last number of months, we've had the incredible wealth of knowledge and wisdom of great rabbis from around the community and around the, the state and even in other states. Just to recap, in 2021 and 2022, we were taught in our Rabbi in Residence series by Rabbi Moshe Brisky, Mordechai Finley, Laura Geller, David Wozniecka, Sharon Browse, Alicia Magal, Elliot Dorf, Jack Bemperad, David Wolpe. And tonight we have the extraordinary gift, and I know that from my own experience with Rabbi J.B. Sachs. I'll tell you why I say that. Not only has he taught at VOS in the past, but he was one of my most inspiring teachers in rabbinic school. I remember classes distinctly. I remember the reading and the conversation and the curiosity that you evoked in me and the inspiration that I took from your teaching. So you were a great, great influence on me and continue to be. So let me invite everybody. I just want to give you a little in, in terms of uh, protocol for, uh, I was going to say COVID, it's not COVID, it's Zoom, that other weird word that we're getting used to. And Zoom protocol means please keep yourself muted. That won't be an issue here in a webinar mode. But what I will ask of you is, if you want to ask a question, my suggestion is make notes as the talk goes along, if you want to make notes to remember them, or just go ahead as a thought occurs to you, use the chat function at the bottom of the screen, or use the Q&A function, relay the message so you don't forget it. And then when Rabbi Sachs ends, concludes his talk, I'll relay your questions to him. Okay, so if anybody specifically wants to be anonymous in that, no problem at all. You can just put Anon next to your question, and I'll respect that, of course. All right, so without further ado, I want to invite Wendy Levinson. Without Wendy Levinson, this series would not have got off the ground. It would not be as successful as it is. So, Wendy, with really great respect and gratitude to you, let me spotlight you and invite you to introduce our rabbi, our teacher tonight. Thank you so much, Rabbi Lee Paz. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for coming tonight. Rabbi Dr. J.B. Sachs serves as spiritual leader of congregation Am Hayam in Ventura and he started his tenure there in January of 2012. He also serves as the education and curriculum specialist for Stories of Music, an adult education project of the Lowell Milton Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music, a longtime advocate of acceptance and inclusion with Jewish life Rabbi Sachs is the first openly gay rabbi in the conservative movement and the first of any movement to be hired as the head rabbi of a non-LGBTQ pulpit. His most recent publication is Psalms in the Key of Healing, a text study for clergy, chaplains, and people living with illnesses. In addition, Rabbi Sachs has co-edited two volumes, We See Ourselves as Redeemed, a Liberation Haggadah, a Passover Seder centered on the personal journeys of LGBTQ Jews, and a manual for rabbis in engaging their communities in embracing gay and lesbian Jews. A social justice advocate, Rabbi Sachs has especially been active on HIV AIDS issues. He founded the AIDS Interfaith Network of New Jersey and helped establish the World AIDS Day commemoration at the Jewish Museum in New York City. Rabbi Sachs previously served as director of Jewish life at D. Toledo High School in West Hills. He taught in the Jewish Studies Department and chaired the Tanakh Hebrew Bible Tract. He also served as consultant on their acclaimed and award-winning production of Rent, and he started an annual World AIDS Day commemoration as well. Rabbi Sachs served for many years on the faculty of the Academy for Jewish Religion, heading the Department of Jewish History and Thought, and teaching future Jewish rabbis, cantors, and chaplains. 
It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce you to Rabbi J.B. Sachs. Thank you so much, um, Rabbi Ron, for your gracious words. And thank you so much, Wendy, for your lovely introduction. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with the Valley Outreach community. One of the oldest and sweetest Hasidic tales tells the story of a young Jewish boy orphaned as a child and adopted into a warm-hearted Gentile family. The boy knew himself to be Jewish, although he did not know exactly what that meant. The boy, the, his simple life as a shepherd, going out each day with his flock, playing his flute all along. One day, sitting at the side of the road, he noticed person after person traveling to the nearby city of Berdichev. One by one, they passed until the boy's curiosity got the best of him and he asked the travelers where they were going. We are on our way to Berdichev to spend the High Holy Days with the great Sadik Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Berdichev. High Holy Days, the boy asked, what are those? The men laughed, silly boy, the Jewish New Year and Yom Kippur. The whole world is being judged. You should not be here with sheep. You belong in the synagogue. The words struck a chord in the boy. Not knowing what to do, but knowing he had to do something and not familiar with the new High Holy Day ticket policy, the boy took his flute and followed the crowd into the synagogue. Never in his life had he ever experienced such a thing. The sound of the Hazan's voice, the townsfolk engaged in prayer, every iPhone out of sight and turned off or set to vibrate. The townsfolk engaged in prayer more than anything else. He realized what he did not know. He could not read Hebrew and he could not recite a single prayer. More than anything in the world, he wanted to join in, but he lacked the tools to do so. And nobody, nobody paid him any attention. All through Rosh Hashanah and then through Kol Nadre and Yom Kippur, he sat seeking a way into this holy community. The time for the concluding Ne'ilah prayers arrived, the tension in the room mounted, and he understood the sanctity of the waning hour. One by one, as was this community's custom, the worshipers gathered at the ark, silent and without kibitzing. In his eighth year, the rabbi's stern admonition seemed finally to have taken effect. So the sacred moment was the moment that some say they saw even the executive director offering prayers of his own. Without, with tears in his eyes and unable to contain himself any longer, the boy took out his flute and began to play. A joyous flurry of searing notes. Yet all the worshipers froze and stared. How dare this child create such an outburst? How dare he desecrate our sacred day, a day when the sound of prayer should come from the heart and not from a secondary source. With every darting eye turned against the boy, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak of Berdichev ran off the bima toward the terrified child and embraced him. This boy, announced the rabbi, has saved us all. All day long, I saw that our prayers had not ascended to heaven. And with the gates of Ne'ilah closing, our names were not yet inscribed in the book of life. Only by way of this boy's pure heart and the pure prayer of his flute, more true than any prayer offered by any of us today, have the gates of heaven opened. We owe this boy our gratitude. May each one of us in this sacred hour learn to pray as he does. To each and every one here this evening, let me express how grateful I am that we have the opportunity to think more intentionally and carefully about DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as we consider what DEI means to us and means for us, let us take in the Hasidic tale just told. Who among us, I wonder, has been that shepherd boy or that shepherd girl looking to enter, but lacking the tools to do so? 
Who is it who stands at the periphery, so desperate to be a stakeholder in our tradition, but unable to get in? Who yearns to participate, but worries about even the small actions they might take that would inadvertently draw the eye rolls, stares, and distaste of the community? For those shepherds who feel distant, how might we meet them where they are in order to make their journey shorter, clearer, and more easily traveled? And so we can get the benefit of their wisdom and talents. Indeed, how can we change the paradigm from what is that person doing here to, oh, what gifts might that person hold out for us? So let's think of those whose gifts are often underappreciated, unseen, or even ignored. Tonight, we think of any of those, but let's start with something that should be by now very comfortable for us. The community of those who might seek entry into Jewish community. Our posture towards the prospective convert. We in particular, should become agents toward creating Jewish families and not gatekeepers in preventing that from happening. We must do so because statistically speaking, our children and grandchildren will fall in love with someone who is not Jewish. We must do so because we believe that the spirit and practice of Jewish life is compelling, worthwhile, and worth sharing. We who are committed to the Jewish future must be ever eager to extend a warm embrace to those seeking to enter the Jewish fold. But let us open our eyes to reality. Not everyone who marries a Jew will convert to Judaism. It may just not be their path. That is often what is referred to as blended families. Yet this too should be simple. Now, no one here wants Judaism to end, but we do not do Judaism, God, Torah, or ourselves any favors by pretending that we are Mordecai of the Purim story atop a high horse, enrobed in supreme righteousness on some sort of inspired mission that requires us to be difficult, ornery people who make the intermarried Jew feel ashamed for falling in love or feel less of a Jew than you are. They are not, and there is no Jewish text, not a single one in our entire tradition that I know of, that supports offensive posturing or behavior. How or why would any Jew or non-Jewish spouse or partner enter Valley Outreach or want to raise their children Jewish if this is how we present ourselves in Judaism? Rather, you and I should be leading the charge to get blended families in through our door, welcome them, embrace them, sit next to them, teach them, encourage them. Remember, the one who enters with a closed mind might yet leave with an open heart. Second, last month, February, was Jewish Disabilities Awareness Month. So we might think of other abled Jews whether unsighted or partially sighted, whether deaf or hearing impaired, those with ambulatory concerns, those located on the autism spectrum and others. How do we respond? Well, sometimes the response of healthy Jews, whatever the intention is perceived and felt more as one of pity than of helpfulness. What programming did Valley Outreach Synagogue have in February highlighting awareness or of advocacy for Jews with disabilities? How inclusive are we? More on this later. February was also Black History Month, and this might also motivate us to think of Jews of color. Population estimates have consistently shown that some 20 to 30% of all Jews living in the greater Los Angeles area are Jews of color. However, these Jews do not feel comfortable entering normative Jewish institutional spaces and environments where they are often treated, even dismissed, as not actually part of the Jewish community. 
what percentage of the membership of Valley Outreach are Jews of color? During Black History Month, did we shine a light on Jews of color here in the Valley? This might be an area of inclusion to think more deeply about. More on this later as well. But let me say that there is nothing in our tradition that demeans anyone because of their color. Judaism holds that everyone is created B'Tselem Elohim in God's image. People of all colors reflect and refract that rainbow of being whom we call God. People hail Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel's participation arm in arm with Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. in the third march from Selma to Montgomery some 57 years ago this week. But from the civil rights movement until today, Judaism itself has not wavered in our commitment to the kavod, dignity of all people. Many other forms of dignity could be highlighted. And I imagine that many of us, if not all of us, have felt excluded, left out, uninvited at some point in our lives. And some of us have been excluded for any number of reasons, even for multiple reasons. I know that I have. Of course, part of that has been how I was treated as a Jew. It's important for us to consider and draw from any experience of anti-Semitism that we have had in order to learn how to better welcome others coming to a Jewish community who exhibit or have a difference. My close friend, Mark Lloyd, announced to me in second grade that he could no longer play with me because I was Jewish. The only fight I ever got into in my life was in sixth grade after constantly hearing bad things about Judaism and my being Jewish from John Conchialoso, who had recently moved to our neighborhood. In seventh grade, my close friend Robbie Morris and I were amateur coin collectors and the only teenagers at the monthly city's numismatics club. I wanted to buy an 1857 half penny, but I had a hard time saving up for it. So Robbie urged me, why don't you chew him down? I think I went into shock and I asked him, what did you say? He repeated the offensive remark. I said, Robbie, to say that someone tries to Jew someone down means that Jews care more about money than being fair with people. Robbie, is that how you feel about me and my family? It took some time and more conversation for our friendship to regain its foothold. In high school, a social studies teacher would single me out whenever a Jewish person was mentioned in the text and call on me to clarify or defend that person. Oh, Samuel Gompers, the president of the American Federation of Labor. JB, I'm sure you know all about him. He's one of yours. These and many other incidents of anti-Semitism have left an indelible impression on me. I was also discriminated against for being left-handed. Yes, really. My junior and high school tennis coach, for example, insisted that no one was really left-handed. I was clearly one of the best players, but he purposely put me lower in our team rankings so that I wouldn't be in the lineup. So I had to play and beat teammates who I never had lost to previously on weekends to regain the ranking I always already earned. Of course, whenever coach was around, I switched to playing left, uh, left-handed. At banquet time, he announced that he had seen me once changing to my left hand, so I was not eligible for any of the postseason awards. And I have experienced at least some of what other able people have experienced. I had a bout of palsy during a part of my time in rabbinical school, and I had a tumor in my left ear, although removed successfully, Baruch Hashem, thank God, diminished my hearing capacity. But more than any scars about my faith or which hand I use or my movement or my hearing, I have been most affected through my experiences as a gay man. 
When I grew up, no one used that term, but there was no neutral, let alone positive term back then. I was, I'm going to share snapshots of my life as a religious Jewish gay man. Some of the following is not pretty, but it is true. I don't know most of you at all. And what I will say is decidedly not delicate. I apologize in advance if the next portion of this share is difficult to hear. I can assure you it was much harder to live through. And I share it not to shock, but so that we all have some understanding of what many, many LGBTQ plus Jews have faced. I grew up taunted by those who just did not understand. I was called Janie, a girl's name, as a child, even by my siblings. I was taunted and baited and lived sometimes very scared. I knew that Judaism stood for justice, so I started thinking that the way to fight injustice might be to become a teacher who could change society through knowledge or a social worker who could uplift those most damaged by hate or a community organizer who could change the world through advocacy and activism. I decided to apply to rabbinical school so that I could do all three, teaching, social worker, and the work of justice, starting in my home base, the Jewish community. I was ordained, as Wendy noted, from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, the flagship institution of the conservative movement back in the 1980s, when it was still a heterosexual male bastion and getting through is difficult. I came out while in rabbinical school, sharing and educating many of my classmates, other students, some teachers and administrators. I actually did not have one single positive reaction, even from the most liberal people. I was told several times that I would not be ordained. In fact, someone came to my room the night before my ordination to tell me that a decision had not yet been reached on whether I would be ordained the next day and they would announce it at ordination if I was or wasn't. I was not out to my parents and aunts and uncles, all of whom had traveled at some distance and expense to New York for this event. And suddenly I was feeling not joy, but humiliation that I was publicly not going to be ordained, but publicly humiliated. Well, I was ordained and I was told later that they decided to ordain me because the leadership was convinced that because I was nice and presented myself well, I would never raise any issues about how LGBTQ plus persons were treated in Jewish spaces. Obviously the decision was made by those who did not know me. My first pulpit was in Jersey City, New Jersey. I was there for nine years, um, a long time for a first pulpit. At that point, AIDS HIV came on the radar screen. I lost over 300 people to AIDS HIV, including my first husband, Mel Rosen, Zichrono Livracha, of blessed memory. For over three years, I tended to Mel, caretaking for other friends, making and delivering food, going to hospitals, funerals, memorial services, rallies, and protests. I started, as Wendy noted, the AIDS Interfaith Alliance of New Jersey and was active in other organizations. But I want to be honest, the Jewish community was not a caring community and I am being generous. When the rabbi walked into Mel's hospital room, Mel was so glad and called out, Rabbi, I am so happy you are here. I've been so ill and I just received a diagnosis of AIDS and I have so many feelings and don't know what to do. I really need to speak with you. The rabbi responded, sorry to hear that, then abruptly turned around, walked out, never to return. I know rabbis who refused to visit their congregants who had HIV and rabbis who would not comfort the parents of people with HIV. I know rabbis refused to officiate at the funerals of, for people with HIV. Apparently they did not deserve a proper Jewish battle, a burial in their eyes. 
And I know of rabbis who did not attend a single minute of shiva with their congregants who, whose children died of AIDS. I know of parents who sent their children to a nursing home two states away so they, they would never have to visit that child. And I know of parents who referred to their children with AIDS as it. After the grief period for my husband, I decided to move to California. As Wendy, as Wendy noted, I became the first rabbi of any movement to apply for and be hired as the head rabbi of a non-LGBTQ synagogue. It was a Kodesh moment, something approaching a big deal. Yet in the interview process, I was asked, many people understand that gay people molest children. If we hire you, how will you assure us that you will control yourselves around the children of this synagogue? Really? You think this is an appropriate question? Statistically, the overwhelming number of child molesters of both girls and boys are heterosexual men. Have you ever asked a heterosexual rabbi this question? I was later invited by a local organizing team of the major annual International Education Conference of Rabbis, Cantors, and Educators of all movements of Judaism to create and lead a panel on AIDS, to create a ceremony for AIDS, and to teach a session on same-sex relationships in Jewish tradition. From the moment I arrived, I was hounded, including from those serving the national organization itself. While the small contingent of Orthodox Jews were surprisingly supportive of my presence, a large delegation tried to marginalize me and demanded that I leave the conference. My life was threatened and the organizers made it clear that even the simplest safety measures were of no concern to them. In fact, anyone talking to me, sitting with me or seen with me was told that if they continued to do so, that they would have their professional lives in the Jewish world taken away from them. For the record, the delegation that demonized me was led by Reform Jews. In the Jewish communities I have lived and served, it has been demanded of me that I never tell anyone I am gay. And once people found out I was gay, it was demanded of me that I never use my title rabbi. I've been sexually harassed by colleagues, at least one of whom was a very prominent internationally known figure. And I've been sexually harassed by congregants, including a ritual chair who was married with children and grandchildren. I was told that I would have a more prosperous career if I joined the reform movement. But although I admire and respect all forms of Judaism and my parents founded the reform temple where we went for Shabbat, being gay does not render me a reformed Jew. I have been told by many that I would have had access to very different kinds of rabbinic positions if I would only do something else or not be gay. So with that background to some of the specifics that I went through, but are hardly unusual, I want to spend a moment speaking about the LGBT plus community and to the LGBT plus community. Those of here tonight who identify within that community all grew up in a world that ignored us or taunted us, excluded us or hounded us. We identify with the Passover story because at the Seder, our people's story acknowledges that the oppression of our people was both physical and psycho-spiritual. We in the LGBTQ plus community have felt both and felt both deeply. It must be admitted that virtually all Jewish institutions, organizations, and synagogues participated in this oppression to one degree or another. This is true, cannot be defended, and should not be minimized. And while we hold up that truth, we must also hold up the truth that the world has changed. Yes, not fully and not far enough, true, but it is different from when we grew up. 
and it is decidedly and decisively better. LGBTQ civil rights are better protected than ever. Our dignity is upheld more than ever. Our opportunities are more robust and that we have far more allies who have raised their voice. If anyone here tonight is a member of the LGBTQ plus community, it is time for us to drop our umbrage and negativity toward God, toward Judaism, and toward spirituality. Virtually all non-Orthodox spaces today are striving to be welcoming and inclusive and have done great work in that regard. Come to Valley Outreach on Shabbat or for other events or classes. I know Rabbi La Paz and I know that he is a wonderful, embracing, inclusive person. Come to VOS and give it a shot. It may not be perfect. And if it is not, maybe it's Bashir. Perhaps it's your moment and destiny to help make this or another community more inclusive. You will have done a mitzvah. You will be better off for it. And you will have opened more eyes and hearts with your fiercest, fierceness and fabulousness. So much has changed in the past 25 years on behalf of inclusion of us all, by all of us who work so indefatigably to establish a big tent that is neurodiverse, racially diverse, and sexually diverse. We who do this work have done so because any attempt to block the participation of our fellow Jews in Jewish community is essentially not an endeavor that is holy or Jewish or community. Jewish tradition teaches that there are 600,000 letters in a Torah scroll. The reason for this precision is that each letter represents one of the 600,000 Israelites who made the covenant with God on Mount Sinai. You may know that if even one letter of a Torah scroll is missing, is not seen, cannot be read in its fullness, then the entire Torah is rendered pasul, unfit for use for reading on a Shabbat morning. This teaches us also that if even one person is not included in the Jewish community, in a synagogue, if even one person is not treated with their dignity of their fullness as a human being, then that community, that synagogue is not a kosher place. It is not whole. And as we begin to kosher our homes for Passover, perhaps we can start, start by koshering our community so that it is more fully welcoming of us all. Today, we speak of the rabbinic principle of kavod habriot, the essential dignity of everyone. Kavod, in Yiddish, I grew up hearing it as kavod, we understand as a combination of respect and honor, but it actually comes from a Hebrew root meaning weight. When we respect someone, we give them weight. We give them a reality. When we do not accord someone due respect, we remove from them their weightiness, their reality. That is, we dehumanize them, at least for that moment. We have not thought of them as carriers of God's image, someone with a neshama, a holy soul. But there is no one without a neshama, and there is no one without God's image. So Judaism makes clear that demeaning anyone is an insult to God. All of this brings us to the questions we must ask this evening. What is it that we must consider to welcome all the shepherds of whatever age or gender who so wish to be among us, to participate with us, to share their music, their gifts? After all, Isaiah exhorts us in God's name that my house of prayer should be a house of prayer for all people, for everyone, God insists. But how do we do that? Well, tonight is not a training session, but let me offer a few thoughts on what community leaders, perhaps including the leadership of VOS might think about. And I'll then offer some practical guidelines and some thoughts for all of us. So first thought is that 
we need to establish a sense of belonging for everyone. But a culture of inclusion cannot merely be imposed, promised, or announced. It must be established. These changes take time, and they aren't always linear. You don't just fast forward to belonging and inclusion. We have to go through the hard work of focusing on diversity and creating that inclusive culture so we can get beyond it to belonging. Part of this process requires tuning into empathy. Each person remembering a time when they were excluded, shamed, interrupted, et cetera, so they can apply those lessons outwardly. That's why I shared snippets of my story this evening. Leaders have to feel it within themselves. They can identify the relationship with feeling excluded, and that's a critical starting point. Having a connection to an organization or group of people that makes someone feel that they can be themselves not only results in their better functioning and health, but diversity leads to better decision-making, greater innovation, and ultimately higher returns. It results in greater engagement and commitment to the synagogue. Inclusion is what connects people to a synagogue community. And I believe it's the core reason why people stay. So if this community is one of the many that's not diverse or not diverse enough in enough ways, it's important to acknowledge the reality and to start talking about it openly with the appropriate people in appropriate forums. Be willing to engage in tough conversations. The more you confront issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the less awkward they'll become to discuss. Now, we can't assume that everyone assumes what you assume. In a previous community, I remember giving a sight-impaired member of my synagogue a reading, which was rendered beautifully. Afterward, a lay leader exclaimed to me privately, wow, I didn't know blind people could read. Valley Outreach might consider having meetings with staff and volunteers to honestly discuss their own experiences that have shaped their current beliefs about diversity. What prejudices might they have developed that are preventing them from pursuing diversity? Or what ideas do they have about changing the community to become more diverse and more welcoming? I, like many people, once thought that the answer to difference, such as race or sexual orientation, was to treat everyone as equal. There is no need to acknowledge differences at all, I thought. I've come to realize that this thinking, although well-intentioned, has been part of the problem. This is because that not acknowledging differences means that we aren't doing tikkun alum, doing our share to make the world a better place, not even our corner of it. It's also sometimes more powerful to acknowledge differences, not by raising issues, but by celebration and joy. Some things are rather simple. If our services tend to be Ashkenaz centric, we can add Sephardic and Mizrahi melodies. If VOS protocols allow, we can assure, ensure that both spouses of a blended family are called up not just for an English reading, but for an ark opening or for Hagba and Glila, for raising and dressing the Torah. One of the great things that Ethiopian Jews have brought to Israel and to the rest of us is the Holy Day of Sigd. It is a holy day observed on the 50th day after Yom Kippur is, and is somewhat of a marker for all of us to assess whether we've lived up to our promises to God seven weeks after Yom Kippur. It's also a day for Israelis to consider to what degree race impacts them. It's now a national holiday in Israel. It's one that my synagogue has begun to observe. It's a way to bring greater awareness of Jews of color and their stories. And it can be done as subtly or as unsubtly as we want. But we should not only consider using Jewish holy days that already exist, we can celebrate our congregants special days in a Jewish context on Shabbat. We can celebrate a lesbian couple's anniversary. 
we can celebrate LGBTQ Pride Day one Shabbat evening during Pride Month. We could acknowledge International Transgender Day of Remembrance or the International Day for Elimination of Racial Discrimination or the International Day of Persons with Disabilities or National Diversity Day. Our American calendar is replete with many special days relevant to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and would help all of us lonely shepherds feel as if we belonged. Practical suggestions. We need to address the reality that 20% of all Americans now live with hearing loss. I do not know what the percentage is at Valley Outreach, but the best way to currently help hearing impaired persons is to have a hearing loop, sometimes called an audio induction loop. It is a special type of sound system for use by people with hearing aids. The hearing loop provides a magnetic wireless signal that is picked up by the hearing aid when it is set to telecoil or to the T setting. On certain important occasions, perhaps High Holy Days or a community Seder, we might have someone signing. It sets an important tone. Thirdly, words do matter. At Day Toledo High School, outside of my actual duties, I spent about two years working with a colleague to go through the entire website and all forms and documents that all arms of the school used to try to raise our sense of inclusiveness. For example, do VOS school forms assume that all parents are opposite gender parents? Or would same gender parents feel comfortable just looking at the form? And on the subject of parents, do we presume that all children have two parents? That is no longer the case. There are many single parents, and there are a lot of children who have three or four parental figures. Not only that, some children are not being raised by parents at all. They are being raised by legal guardians. Reviewing our documents to update them to be more equitable and in line with reality can be time consuming, but it sends a welcoming message. Basic etiquette is often simple, but not necessarily intuitive. For example, it's helpful and telling if we use person first language. This means that making the person, not their difference, the subject. Sometimes differences are simply not irrelevant. A person's ethnicity or sexual orientation or health status does not usually need to be front and center. Some people when they see me always seem to mention something about they just heard that a celebrity came out as gay or some other LGBT concern or item of interest as if I have no other pieces to my life as a human being. But I am a person first who has many sides, many interests. Being Jewish is one of them. Nonetheless, sometimes it must be admitted that difference is relevant and of concern. In such cases, we employ person first language. For example, we don't need to speak of a handicapped person but rather a person who uses a wheelchair. I know that this is challenging in English because we usually construct our sentences by placing the adjective before the noun. However, this distinction to people with difference is important because it shows us that you see us in our fullness as humans. In thinking about our words, we should also check our presumptions. We should not presume anyone's sexual orientation, health, gender, or really almost anything, including how people want to be referred or addressed. Rabbi La Paz and I have known each other for many years, but that does not mean that I should always presume when it's comfortable to call him Ron and when it's comfortable to call him Rabbi La Paz. But I do not have to wonder about this because I can ask Rabbi how to address him at any specific occasion or how to refer to him when he's not present. People who understand themselves as gender non-conforming or non-binary or transgender or gender queer do not fit into the boxes that we have often constructed for convenience. When many of us grew up, 
these terms were not used. And many people who were gender nonconforming were less visible to us. But today, some 30% of all young people now understand themselves as falling into this category. Having spent 10 years at Day Toledo High School, I know that this has been a sea change in our culture. So respectful words, behavior, and policies now mean a number of things with regard to non-binary people. For one, it means having gender neutral bathroom facilities available or at least appropriate bathroom usage policies. It means learning and respecting that the pronouns we grew up using to refer to people do just, just do not work for everyone. That's because people in this broad category of gender nonconforming often do not see themselves as either a he or a she. We have been resilient in getting through this pandemic. So I am sure that we can all adjust to a respectful use of pronouns. And speaking of words, what of the printed word? It's good practice to ensure that there are always at least three large print cedar rain prayer books, three large print copies of the Chumash Torah reading, and three large print copies of any handouts available. If there is only one large print copy of anything, people will not take it because they are afraid of taking it from someone who might, in their minds, need it more. If handouts are difficult, perhaps they can be placed online ahead of time so people can enlarge them and print them off before they arrive. This could also be helpful for people who are dyslexic. A large font size means using a font size that is at least 14 points. In selecting a font, Arial is also considered easy to read for people who have low vision or who are dyslexic because it has wider spacing and the letters are less stylized than in Times New Roman. Hopefully as well, the pandemic has taught us that we should not touch anyone or anything without first asking. We should not hug a person without asking. Many people have ASD or PTSD and they do not want to be touched. There is no reason to play with or pet a guide dog without first asking a permission. Guide dogs are working and they are on duty and they did not show up merely for our pleasure. A final example, we should not touch a person's wheelchair without first asking. And speaking of wheelchairs, while it's important to have a good wheelchair ramp, it's also important to build a social ramp. Often the hardest friend for someone to make in a community is the first one, especially if you exhibit a difference. It's often good to identify and train specific individuals who will reach out and be that first friend when someone with a difference comes through the door. Encourage them to introduce others from the congregation and model appropriate interaction and communication for the rest of the community. Remember as well that some people have a difficult time with social interactions, but they may still long deeply for friendships and will likely need someone to be a social ramp into those relationships. My thoughts for all of us. Grand pronouncements from a movement's leadership team alone does not shift a culture. A top-down approach is simply not enough. It drives compliance, but not commitment. So it's important that every individual, all of you, see and understand your role in enlarging the big tent of VOS. Don't be hypersensitive. We live in a day where so many people get so offended so quickly over so practically anything. So we should all strive to make the extra effort to be respectful of one another. We all bear a sweetness inside our neshama and we need to release it more often. But we also know that none of us are sweet all the time. So we also need to drop our hypersensitivity. If you are easily offended, perhaps you think too highly of yourself. Moses in our tradition was known for humility, not snarkiness. He should be our role model. 
Third, we should choose relationships over comfort. We must intentionally work out of our proverbial comfort zones to try to build relationships with those who are different with, from us. Invite someone to coffee or lunch or Shabbat dinner. Your kids or grandkids might play with theirs. Be intentional. We've all got to work at it. Be real. Some people change their personality in order to befriend people of other ethnicities. You do not need to change your voice or sentence structure when speaking with African Americans. And you do not need to camp it up when speaking with gay men. There is no need to be fake. Just be who you are. You are enough. People with a difference are not looking for clones, but for connection. If you are just who you are, you'll have a much better chance of reaching out, uh, reaching someone not like you than otherwise. And the connection forged will be more authentic and longer lasting. This evening, speaking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I could, and I pray it does, send a clear signal that the community mission of Valley Outreach must be one of radical welcoming. That is what makes the word outreach, outreach. Whether or not it succeeds, however, depends not primarily on the prayer book or a particular melody or the architecture or the board structure or any sermon that Rabbi La Paz might forge. Rather, diversity and inclusion depend on you, every one of you. When you greet the person of color walking into this building for the first time, what you say, and not what I say, will determine if she or he or they will come back. How a gay couple is greeted when you see them giving each other a loving Shabbat Shalom kiss on their way into the Oneg Shabbat refreshments or the Kiddush, that only you can determine. And what about the one whose hearing aid buzzes too loudly? And what about the Utzedek adult who, God bless them, has trouble sitting still during services? And what about the one who speaks or sings a bit too loudly? Will your eyes, like those of the congregants in the Hasidic tale I told, shoot darts at that shepherd, that worshiper? Or will your words and gestures communicate that your prayer, and indeed the Jewish people, is more shalem, more complete, because someone who is different cared to come and sat somewhere near you? Can we follow not the crowd, but Reb Levi Yitzhak, in also going toward the one who is new, the one who seems interesting, the one who is different, and go and embrace them? I would like to share something that I know about people on the periphery. We don't want your pity. In fact, we don't want special treatment at all. All we want is that here in a synagogue, a synagogue of all places, that we are seen, greeted, and received no differently than anyone else, that we are treated as individuals who bear God's image. After all, what is being Jewish really, if not to live with an awareness that we were once strangers in a strange land and have that awareness inform all our interactions? As the prophet Isaiah teaches us at the height of Yom Kippur morning, the rituals of Judaism are rendered hollow and meaningless if they are not accompanied by a compassionate and eager welcome of the strangers among us. Friends, sometimes the spiritual heroics of embracing diversity involve nothing more than a kind word, a warm handshake, and a generous smile. These are the gestures that demonstrate we are an inclusive community. They demonstrate the open hearts we profess we have. In the days ahead, in the years ahead, every Shabbat and every day, may we never be so comfortable that we become inured to the needs of the outsider seeking to come in. After all, are we not, each and every one of us, desperately seeking to stand in God's presence? Let us hold each other up as we strive to do so. May we always be the sort who signal, in spirit and in deed, that our community has been made whole by the presence of another. The rabbis teach us to say a bracha, a blessing, whenever we see anything unusual. 
For example, if we encounter a stunning mountain range or a vast desert, we praise God for fashioning the works of creation. If we see a comet or hear thunder, if we see a rainbow, there is a bracha for each one of these experiences. Our tradition also offers a bracha whenever we encounter a person who is unusual in some way, such as a very tall person or anyone else who looks or seems different from the norm. It goes like this, and with yourself still muted, please repeat after me. Baruch Ata Adonai. Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Mishaneh Et HaBriot. Amen. Literally, this means, praised are you, Adonai, your God, ruler of the universe, who has created a diversity of human beings in the world. Think about it. This bracha has us bless people whom we might deem other so that we can reframe ourselves to think not that this person is different as much as this person bears something special and comes to us as a blessing. This bracha suggests the value of human diversity, which is also seen here as an expression of God's will, as something that makes the world better. The Hebrew phrase Mishana et habriot does mean to create diversity of human beings, but the word Mishana also means to change. So one could understand Mishana et habriot to mean the one who changes human beings. If we understand the phrase this way, when we say the bracha, we are expressing gratitude for, to God for creating within us, not those whom we might be observing, the ability to change, to change the way we think about norms and differences, to change the way we relate to others. We are often hobbled, my colleague Rabbi Arthur Levinsky writes, by our own prejudices and discomfort. Deep down inside, we realize that we need to work on ourselves. We need to try to change and transcend our prejudices. We need to try harder to welcome others into our community and into our hearts. Interpreted this way, the blessing is not just acknowledging the world as it is, it's giving us a vision of the world as we would like it to be. All of these nuances are worth holding on to. May we thank God for the presence of diversity in the world. May we thank God for creating each and every person as uniquely holy individual. May we also thank God for our potential to change and embrace. May we do our best to change ourselves in such a way that we can help our community become one in which every shepherd is welcomed and valued, where everyone can play their melody, where everyone finds their place. Amen. Amen. I've been listening to you and thinking about who we are as a congregation, who I am as a rabbi. Let me unmute myself. Did you hear me? Thank you so, so much, Rabbi Sachs. I knew you'd bring something special and important to us, knowing you and having my experience of you and my experience, as I said, of being changed by you. And what happened to me listening to you, I'll give you a reflection, was I learned and I thought deeply about my leadership, and about our community and about all of us and this idea of what it is to be an ambassador of a set of values. And I think in a sense, that's the essence of what you said that all of us have an obligation, a sacred obligation to be ambassadors for the best of who we are. And I also thought about what we do well and there were certain areas where I gave myself a little pencil mark, a check mark saying, yeah, we do that, we do that. But I think we can always do them better. And there's certain areas where I think we're failing you know, we could certainly do better, or at least let me assume that there's somebody in the community who might say we're failing. That might be even more important than what I think. So I think for all of us watching this, we might want to think about that. It's not the pride we might take in how welcoming we are, but is that the experience of the person who walks through the door? Uh, and as you say, I, 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 don't, I can't imagine that there's anybody listening to you and listening to your stories and words and even your own personal stories that doesn't have some hair on the back of their head stand up because they go, that's me too in some way. 
there's some difference that I represent and that I've experienced some kind of otherness being othered by other people as a result of it. As a child, I think we all have those memories and certainly as an adult as well. So thank you I'm from the bottom of my heart. What I wanna do is, as I said to you, Rabbi Sachs, before the session, we're recording this. I have a long flight to Israel. I'm gonna take the recording and watch it again, this time with notes. And I wanna make some notes because what I loved about what you did, you weren't just aspirational. This is what could be. You were very pragmatical and, uh, pragmatic and said, this is what can be, and here's a plan, and here's a way to do it. And I want to do that. I want to take that seriously and make meaning of what all the good, the wisdom that you shared. So thank you. I want to read to you a couple of comments that came in. And in the meantime, anybody who has a comment to share, Ethel, you put your hand up before. Uh, it may have been Ethel, you, you gave a note. Instead of putting your hand up, which we can't see or hear, use the chat bar or Q&A at the bottom if you have something to say. So, so far, what I see are not questions, but praise, comments. Is Shakoch Rabbi, or as the kids say, way to go. You provided us a wonderful education. Thank you. And that was Ethel and Barbara says, thank you for sharing your amazing journey. Lots to think about. Absolutely. I have another commitment have to leave, of course. And Betsy says, thank you in bold and caps so much. You've given me so much to think about. Does anybody else have anything else that they want to ask? One thing I know about an evening like this is I think a lot of us have discomfort. We don't know how to handle the new realities of pronouns and gender. It's confusing. I've been at a lot of dinner tables where people have said, I don't even know what to do with this. And I'm afraid to even engage because I'm afraid I'm gonna get it wrong and feel mm -hmm. like a fool and be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. um, what do you say to that? How can people, what do you say so, to people, good people, good hearted people say, I just don't wanna fail in this. I don't know how to engage with my sure. grandchild or their, their verbiage, let's say. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, and uh, what I usually say to that is that it's really important that we all assume goodwill. And when somebody comes from a place of goodwill, uh, we, we trust them and their intent. And we don't have to, and, but we, we all have to assume that everyone's going to make a mistake because we're human, we're not God. And we're imperfect, not perfect. That's what Rosh Hashanah comes to help us uh, and the whole experience of the High Holy Days comes to help remind us that we're human and imperfect. And that of course we, we can do better and we should focus on ways that we can strive to do better. Uh, and we are not, uh, but we are imperfect. Being imperfect does not absolve us of the responsibility to try to be better, um, but it should take off the edge from fearing to try lest we make a mistake knowing that number one, God will forgive us and that um, uh, hopefully the community that we're developing and creating is a community of kindness and goodwill. And when you assume goodwill, that means you assume goodwill. You should have no reason to think that any comment that anyone makes is coming from a snarky place. I know that we've all had the experience of misreading or thinking that a text or an email was really mean-spirited and we found out it wasn't. Or it could have been our email or our text that was misinterpreted as mean-spirited or unkind when we didn't mean it at all. Um, it's very, very easy to jump and misinterpret it. And rather than jumping and misinterpreting, we should assume that a person meant something good. In fact, there's a, there's a phrase for that in our tradition from the Mishnah in Pir Pirkei Avot that says, Dan l'chasachut. You should judge things in the most favorable way. Now, if you have very clear evidence that, you know, uh, you know, somebody is doing something mean-spiritedly, pull them aside and talk to them privately. We don't want to embarrass them. You want to say, you know, it felt like you had a little bit of an edge there. I just want to check in with you. And is there something that you brought into today's meeting that you were whatever, um, but it might be nice to take a breath and then go back into the meeting because we don't want that atmosphere to, to reign. But, but if you assume goodwill, you can you, you say, oh, this guy meant something really great about that. I have to think about it. Or I can do a clarifying question. I heard you say X, what did you mean by that? Um, any of those strategies of assuming goodwill, asking for clarification, pulling a person aside uh, privately during a break or whatever it can be, 
all can be very, very helpful in, in, in taking away some of that energy we carry around sometimes needlessly. So one of the things that brings me back to something you said earlier, which is we tend to take offense too easily rather mm -hmm. than seeing the best in people and not necessarily thinking that it's aimed at us or meant to harm us or, or hurt us. I wanna ask you a sensitive question. Something that I hear particularly from older members of my community is when we're living in a new world of new words and new realities and transgenderism and teenagers um, deciding on changing their gender. And one of the things that I heard from somebody the other day was she was talking about a member of her family who said, I just don't like the way this person is in relation to my grandson. And I said, why is that? What's the issue? He said, and she said, well, it's not that he's not loving. He is, but his assumption is this Mike, this grandchild is too young to know this about themselves in a, at a teenage and too young, therefore, to make what could be a permanent change to their reality as a human being, their ability to procreate, et cetera. What's your experience and what's your thought on that? Do you give respect to any child or young adult and say, well, if they say it's true, then it's true? Do you say, well, it's not a rabbi's question to answer, it's a psychologist, psychiatrist's answer, question to answer? What would be your thought? So there, there are several things. One is that um, Judaism does place great emphasis on personal testimony. Um, that is how the new moon was established, uh, how everything in court was by personal testimony. We take people's sincere testimony very, very seriously. So if somebody says that they are uh, transgender or non-binary or they, they are lesbian or whatever it is that they say, um, or that they have trouble reading, um, and, and, you know, then, then we should say, well, maybe then we have to take our children seriously and maybe they are transgender and maybe they have, maybe they are dyslexic or maybe they have a, a something that we need to test for or find out about, but we shouldn't dismiss it and we shouldn't dissuade and tell them that their experience of reality is not real and that the experience of reality that I want for them is the one they must adopt. That actually is cruel and not caring. Um, in effect, um, um, it is really sort of giving them a Mitzrayim to live in when, when Mitzrayim is the last place that Jews should be. Um, we will find out more about that on Passover. Um, but it is also the case that, that science has, uh, it's not for certain when things are, are in place. Um, uh, some, some studies suggest a prenatal, some suggest there's some sort of what is like a biologic ad adaptation in the first six months or so of life. But once somebody reaches a very, very young age before they even have awareness, their sexual orientation and gender identity are set in place. They can't actually be changed. They can only be recognized and celebrated. So you're even, so it's like saying to somebody who says, well, I wanna use my left hand. There's no such thing as left-handed, you must use your right hand. And there's about the same number of people in the world who are left-handed as there are uh, LGBTQ. So it is, it is a reality that I know from both ways um, because my mom and, and my sister were also told that they were not left-handed as well. Um, and uh, uh, there is a science, now we know that there are people who are just left-handed and some people are, are ambidextrous. They, can, they are bi, they can use either hand, right? Um, uh, and uh, so I think that we need to take that science seriously and, and um, uh, as well as their experience um, and realize that our concern isn't actually their concern, it's actually our concern. By trying to tell a child not to be who they believe themselves to be, we are not actually protecting the child, we're actually protecting ourselves. And our job as parents or grandparents or as educators or, or, or rabbis or leaders should not be to protect our own feelings, but to protect and safeguard the welfare and well being of children. That is really very, very critical and crucial. Um, uh, for us to, and it's hard to sometimes maintain those distinctions, um, particularly uh, for some people feel there's more um, things about sexuality might be fraught with more background for some people than let's say um, a learning disability. 
or being on the uh, autism spectrum or something like that. Um, but all of these things are of one fell swoop and the medical community, the psychological community, mental health community um, are at one. And finally, it is also the case that the um, rabbis were aware of gender distinctions. The Mishnah mentions six different gender identities in the Mishnah alone, all of which um, are honored and have a place. And every culture in human history actually has made places in their culture for, uh, for LGBTQ plus people. Some of those ways were often in some cases, uh, places of honor and celebration. Uh, the Bear Deach in certain um, uh, Native American communities um, in, North, in North America and South America, and then certain other communities, there's always been spaces made. Um, and we should be able to make a space in our families and in our synagogues for people who know who they are, and we should love them, celebrate them, learn from them, help them enrich us, um, and give them a safe space for their Jewish lives to be lived out robustly and keenly. And you know, once we stop trying to manage how other people live and actually listen to them and, and live with them and celebrate with them, we realize how much will grow from their, from having different people around me. I love people of different kinds of political ideas, of different kinds of other ideas, um, who think differently about Judaism than I do, who do halakha differently than I do. Uh, I love all, all the differences. That's why I love teaching at AJR, which as you know, Rabbi La Paz, your alma mater, um, is a place to celebrate every kind of portal entryway and every kind of way of doing and being Jewish. And, and because the more you interact with more kinds of people and get out of our own bubbles, the more we actually grow and think and develop ourselves. And then we can be better uh, participants in, in our synagogues and in our world. Let me read the next question that came in. I want to ask you a quick thing before I read that question, just to hold in your sure. head. Sure. You mentioned a statistic that I've heard before. I don't know if it, you said 30 or 40 percent, maybe it was 20 of American Jews are Jews of color. And I wonder what that statistic holds. Are we talking about black Jews? Or are we also talking about Mizrahi Jews, Yemenite Jews, Moroccan Jews? Who's included? Because that's a very large number. Do you know but, while I while I read the next question? My, my understanding um, is that um, it in, include it, it does include um, Mizrahi Jews, Yemenite Jews. Not that there is many. There are more. Let's say I do not know to what degree um, uh, Persian Jews are included, um, but 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 certainly other Mizrahi Jews, um, Moroccan Jews, um, and others are are included in that statistic. Um, but there is uh, definitely. Um, uh, been an influx of, of Latino Jews, um, African American Jews, uh, Asian Jews uh, in in the LA area, and the statistics I read were largely from the from the greater LA area, and they consistently show 20 to 30 percent. But even if it's the low end, 20 percent is one out of every five. Right. I know my sister said that her, the last president of her synagogue was in was Asian and that he was the best president they ever had at that synagogue. They actually wanted to change the rules so he could actually be on another term. Um, he was so effective. And and they, uh, uh, and I noticed there's more synagogues I'm reading about who have an Asian American cantor or rabbi or right. have a blind rabbi or cantor or have an, an African American uh, or Korean American. I'm starting to read and see more and more as I look around what's going on in LA and in the world beyond. We're starting to see more diversity, but I think it's been harder for people of color to go into, especially Ashkenazic centric spaces that tend to be white and tend to have not been dealing with issues of inclusion as well as we might have. Um, um, but, you know, my um, uh, grandmother used to say, it's never too late to do the right thing. Right. And so I urge us to think about that just because we can't look backward at what we could have done 10 years ago or five years ago and didn't. We have to look about what is, what is sacred living for us today and how do we make this space a healthier and more spiritual space for everyone. Well said, I agree. Let me just add a, a question from Larry. Larry says, I know someone at high school, I knew, know or knew, who, and I must be no currently, who used the wrong pronoun inadvertently and was verbally and physically attacked. 
He's a caring person who's not concerned at all with someone's sexual orientation. At the school, there doesn't seem to be an equitable measure or method of handling situations like this one. What does a parent do about this? So um, again, I would say, um, you know, we're, our whole culture is in process of change and people are not always perfect, but we should assume goodwill. We should assume that the school wants to do the right thing. We should assume that teachers want to do the right thing and that they want to treat everyone well. And we should assume that, a, you know, um, that a, I'm not sure what the word wrong means in this case, but if somebody used a pronoun that somebody else felt, you know, please use a different pronoun or something. I, I don't know what the actual interaction was. I don't know sure. the incident. So I'm actually speaking without any background. So I can't speak to the specifics of an incident I know nothing about. That's really not fair to any side and it's not helpful. But in general, I think that a parent should uh, assume goodwill, should ask for um, an appropriate procedure. And if an appropriate, and if, if the pr procedure that the school suggests doesn't, first of all, we should trust that maybe it is fairer than we might think, but we should suggest an additional step or process um, um, in addition to any process that's suggested to make sure that feelings of all sides, we should want to, as parents, I know that I, if, if my son ever did something to another child, um, I wanted to de not just defend my, my son, I want to make sure the other child was, was okay. And if the child offended or did something to, to Evan, to my son, then I still wanted to make sure that that child was okay. I didn't want the child punished. I want a teaching moment. I want us to stop with this cancel culture and with this, I got you and you're not a good person and I'm through with you, I'm gonna befriend you. And if you stick around, I'll behead you or something. I don't like that yeah. kind of approach. I right. think right. that right. there's room for all of us to be loving and to grow. And even people who do something that is, that's more on the victimizing side rather than the victim side, that we should assume goodwill and should assume that there's a teachable moment in play here, a spiritual possibility, a psychological, there's a space in that person's heart that we can touch. And I don't think, especially with children, that we should never give up on children. Where there's life, there's hope. And we should actually not just freak out, we should freak out for a minute and take a deep breath, but then we should actually get to the business of protecting children. And at a school, that means having the appropriate conversations with, if there's a guidance counselor, if there's um, with the teacher or whoever the adult in the room was, if there was one when this took place, if there was whatever. And for, for anybody, child, adult, or school who do the wrong thing, it's never too late to do the right thing. Yeah. Rabbi Sachs, this has been really enlightening. Thank you. You're a wonderful human being. I know that firsthand. You're a real gift in my life. I wish we saw each other more often. I hope we will. Thank and you. you're a wonderful teacher and a great rabbi. I'm really grateful to you. Thank you. I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to be with the, the VOS community. I'm grateful to see you and, and be part of this. And if you do, um, no pressure and, and don't be self-conscious. If you do go back or want to rethink anything and you want to connect with me to have a, a, another discussion yeah, I've already offline thought about that. Or, or, like or, that. or with VOS in any way, publicly or behind the scenes, sure. I'm happy to continue this discussion. Um, and really uh, uh, to the Valley Outreach community, you really have a treasure here. This, uh, this man is a true gift to the uh, Jewish world. And I hope that you actually... Uh, appreciate him, um, not just in words, but in deeds, and that you really um, uh, tell him, you know, I'm really proud of the community that we've been in process of creating, and that, that, that you know, I'm willing to step up to be a small, to do my share in making this community better for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Wendy, let me spotlight you so you can say the concluding words, and thank you to everybody. Let me say one quick thing, Wendy. This is recorded. We'll make it available. My guess is based on what all of us heard tonight, you'll want not only to hear it again, but I think more importantly, you'll want to share it with somebody. So please feel free when you receive it to share it. Thank you so much, Rabbi Sachs, for your meaningful and personal talk. You've given us a lot to think about, and we are so grateful to you for educating us, for sharing your story 
and your words of wisdom with us. And we really appreciate your honesty and openness. We learned so much from you and we thank you for the time you spent with us. I'd like to invite everyone to join us at our next Rabbi in Residence program on Thursday, April 21st, when we'll have Rabbi Tirza Firestone speak to us on Wounds into Wisdom, our innate power to heal. Rabbi Tirza will share stories, case studies, and practices from her award-winning book, Researching People from Around the World Who Have Lived Through Extreme Trauma and Have Transformed Their Lives. Her experiential presentation will shed light on the many ways that the past traumas shape current and even future generations and how it is possible to rise up after devastation and reclaim your innate wisdom and inner freedom. Rabbi Firestone will draw from neuroscience, psychology, and ancient Jewish wisdom and values to illuminate our innate power to transmute loss and tragedy into post-traumatic growth. You can find us on our website at vosla.org. And please contact me if you would like to sponsor a rabbi. We look forward to seeing you next month on the 21st. So be sure to mark your calendars for an insightful and interesting evening. Thank you again for coming tonight and I wish you well. Good night.